Oh, it's good. All right. All right, stop, collaborate, and listen. Uh, Reese is here with a new presentation. Sometimes acid pipeline gets confusing. So here's some tips and tricks y'all should be using. Will it ever stop? Yo, I don't know. Turn off the lights, and I'll glow, and I'll stop right here, actually. So, so that's my little intro. This is more towards the junior devs and people starting out in Rails. Uh, tips and tricks, so we're just going to jump right in. So tip number one, don't do this. Uh, <laughs> It really is true. Really, really, really don't do this. You all are devs. You should know better. <laughs> and if not, you're going to open up a whole can of hurt. So first things first, as developers, you're going to be like, hey, I know what to do. Um, and you do the whole typey type thing. And you type in Rails S or Rails server in your console. And you do the clicky click. And click on localhost 3000. And you see your website. Uh, that's the console output up top. And then on the bottom is you see the background image, you see the little image, the CSS is rendering, everything looks good. So then you deploy to prod. And what happens? This. And you're like, hold on, wait a second. Where's that awesome picture in the background? It's all gone. It was, local, it was working you know, in dev mode. Why is it not working in prod? So tip number two is test locally in prod. So my job at Ninefold is a rail support engineer, and this is a uh, a common thing that I have to always say to people whenever they say assets are broken on our system, and I'm like, did you guys test locally in prod? And most of the answers are usually no. So it is really, really important. First things first, do the typey type thing, do Rails S minus E production, otherwise known as Rails M equals production, Rails S. And you do the clicky click, and things break again. And this is exactly why we say test locally in prod. You can see at the very top, that you get the no route, uh, no route matches get, and you don't actually see anything. So going on to the first trick, let's get local prod working. But before we do that, I'm going to talk really briefly about some differences between dev and prod. And in your config environment, development.rb and production.rb, there's a, there's a line that says config assets compile equals true in dev, and it's going to be false in production. So it's true in dev because assets are actually compiled on the fly, and in uh, production uh, assets are actually, or sorry, production actually assumes the assets are already pre-compiled, and that's a huge difference. So then you do the typey type thing, and you do get checkout minus b test prod, otherwise known as you know check out a new branch. Let's call it test prod. And then you're going to uh, compile your assets by doing Rails env equals production bundle exec rake assets precompile, typey type clicky click, and it breaks. So what happened? Uh, this, this happened. That's Webrick. That's the best image of Webrick out there, probably. Uh, <laughs> because it is the dumbest uh, web server out there. Um, so what do you do? You go to your production.rb file, and you actually change, and you actually add, sorry, uh, config.server static assets equal true. And this basically tells Webrick, the, the dumb web server, that, hey, I have some assets in my public assets folder. Do something with it. Serve it out. And it does. Oops. And there you go. When it does, when you run it again, boom. So the next one is trick number two with CSS and images. I, I'm not really a fan of CSS at all, and you will see why. So originally, I'll write code that looks something like this. And I think it works because I, it works in dev. And in prod, it actually doesn't. So instead, there's two different versions. If you have .css, .erb, then you have the erb little thingies, I forget what they're called. But if you have uh, .css sass, this is what you have to use. The uh, underscore path and the uh, dash URL, dash path, those are helpers, and they will actually help you out. They'll tell you exactly where to look for those files in the asset pipeline. And for Rails 3.2 users, this is the last tip. Basically, you want to add this gem to your gem file, and it basically speeds up your asset pre-compilation because it won't do them over every time you run it. So the ones that have already been done are ignored. All the new ones will actually be run again, <clears throat> and it'll actually speed up. And it's so good that it actually was in, implemented in uh, the core of Rails 4. And that's really it. So you, hopefully you learned something new. Give yourself a high five. Give somebody else a high five. That's me. That's my Twitter handle. The end. All right, my name is uh, Corey, 
Um, this is kind of my information. I'm a recent graduate of G School, so you know there's a few of you out there. I'm also looking for work for those of you that need work. Um, does anybody here use Alfred or know what Alfred is? All right, cool. So. Alfred is awesome, and I'm here to kind of show you a couple cool things you can do. This might be aimed at more of the beginners. Uh, when I first started uh, G School, one of the things that really impressed me was the ability to use Alfred and Dash, which is a, like a document handler. Really easily, I can just kind of type in Rails and then, you know, has secure password, something like this. Boom, up come the docs. Really quick and easy, I can jump into you know, Ruby, Array, awesome. You know, it just pulls up the docs, and as a beginner, you look at the docs a lot. So this came in really handy. Uh, but the coolest thing I found about Alfred was the ability to kind of write your own scripts. It handles Ruby, so I was like, great, I'm studying Ruby, so I'm gonna write my own Ruby script. And also, as a beginner, I found doing Rails new a lot, which means going to the Ruby Gem site and getting all the versions and all of this. Every day we were doing Rails new or writing new Ruby projects, so I wrote a little Alfred workflow that kind of allows us to go in and I can go grab the RSpec gem. It'll pull up all these different uh, versions, so I can just kind of do a command enter here. Oh, let's try this again. And it'll just paste it right into my gem file. So I can do this for any of the gems. If I don't know exactly what it's called, I can uh, do a gem search in Rails RSpec, and it'll just pull up the page, do a search for me. You know, that's not what I'm looking for, but anyway. Um, so that was um, basically a small little workflow that I developed if you want it. Um, there's tons of workflows for those, those of you who don't know. GitHub also, there's, you can download, people kind of create these workflows, download them. Um, so I have one here. This basically um, will go through, goes to my GitHub repository. Here's my uh, RubyGem workflow if the internet works, which it doesn't look like it's working. Anyway, I guess it's not working, so that's what you get for live coding. So that's about it, but um, this is my website. There's an article on here, if it ever loads up, uh, called uh, Alfred is Amazing, something like that. You can go ahead and find it, download this gem. There's a lot of cool tools out there, and as a beginner, I highly recommend it. Thank you. Let's just get started. Oops, sorry. So the one thing I want to talk about is the human connection that Lightning Talks a little bit uh, sparked by Pamela's talk yesterday on the company culture. And one of the things there that I find is important and interesting is the dealing with the tough stuff. And for that, I think it's important to look at the human connection. I want to go through two examples when you start a new job and you have your first day and you get set up with your email and everything and then you get to dive into code and you do your stuff and then of course, something goes wrong, and you have a merge conflict or something, and all of a sudden, one of your new coworkers is standing next to you and is like, you broke something, what's going on here, that's not okay, and you're like, oh my god, I'm the new guy here, I did something wrong, and it's super easy for the other person to just see you as that new guy, and that makes for a pretty shitty experience. So imagine a different scenario, or same scenario where you get new hired, but you get set up and everything, and then actually everybody in your team takes some time to sit down with you and have a 15, 30 minute conversation about something they like, something you like, and you start building that human connection with that person where you basically see, oh, we like dogs, oh, we actually don't like bicycling, oh, we like to go on hikes. So you build something that you share and you build a human connection. And then if you go back to that same scenario where you do something and something goes wrong, your coworker showing up next to you is not going to be looking at just, oh, the other guy, the new guy. It's going to be much harder to dehumanize it because you have a personal relationship. Oh, she also likes cats. Oh, we like cats. You maybe even know the cat's names or kids' names or whatever it is. You have that personal connection. And based on that, 
you can actually interact on that level and see the other person as a human with feelings and everything that comes with it. And based on that, you interact on that level. So basic idea is you start building that connection before you have to solve the tough stuff, and then solving the tough stuff together is actually easier because you do it on a human level. And we're all, or most of us here, are familiar with uh, stand-up procedures in the agile world that you do that every morning on your project or at some point during the day where you check in about the status of the project and what you did the last day, what you're going to do, what is in your way. And one thing you can add to that as a practical tip is do something called check-ins, where you basically take a few minutes where every person on the team gets to check in personally, and there's some format around it in the links I have in the next slide that can actually give you some guidance on what to do, but it's basically the idea is you talk a little bit about how you feel that day and if you have something to share that's important. So just to give a little bit of a context to your team about your state, which helps recreate that personal connection and reinforce it. There's some good resources out there. The Matrix Leadership Institute here out of Boulder focuses very much on that connection within teams and building those connections. They offer awesome trainings. And then there's also a book called Software for Your Head, where, which was done by the McCarthy's. And they have the core protocols. And one of those protocols is the check-in that, that I talked about, where you can basically have a certain format I've been doing this with my team for the last couple of months with huge success in terms of just people getting close to each other and it being easier to solve problems and have more successful meetings. So it's definitely something worth checking out and looking into. If you have any questions, feel free to talk to me. Thanks. All right, so good to see everyone. I'm a QA engineer. I thought I'd give something a little three-minute talk on something that isn't tech. So this is something I've been telling people about for a while, and every time I try and talk about it, I get these blank stares from people. So what is methane hydrate? So first off, I'm not an expert on methane hydrate. I'm not a marine biologist. I'm not a fuels guy, geologist, anything like that. Basically, dead stuff stinks to the bottom of the ocean. Over time, it gets compacted until it's low enough in the earth where it's warm, starts breaking down, creating methane and then the methane bubbles start to rise, and then they rise to where it's cooler, and they get trapped in this soccer ball-type lattice. And yeah, basically it's ice that you can burn. So where is it? It's off the coast of pretty much everywhere. How much is there? I'm not gonna read this all out to you, but they estimate there's you know, between 50 and you know, 300 years of the stuff. So there's a, just a ton of it. So again, where is it? The yellow ones are where it's been recovered already, and blue is where it's thought to exist. So why aren't we using it now? Currently, it's really expensive to get at. And right now, it risks damaging the equipment. The Japanese government's put a ton of money into it. They've built this huge ship that they think can get at it. But it's still a lot of experiments by a lot of different countries to get at it. So why do I care? Well, first off, Scientists care about it. It's ice you can burn, which is pretty awesome. And the molecule looks neat. So it will save the climate. So there's this thing, uh, sequest sequestration, where one of the ways they've been able to get at this stuff is by pumping carbon dioxide down near the molecules, and the molecules will suck it up and release the methane gas. So they've figured they are able to harvest tons and tons of natural gas while also sequestering tons of carbon. So this has been proven by a bunch of people. Uh, natural gas, I'm sure you hear all the time, is cleaner than coal, and a fifth of our energy comes from coal right now, which is, I know, a lot. Another reason you should care about it is it will destroy the climate. So there's this 3% uh, rule, which is, you know, natural gas, once you lose 3% of it, that leaks and then it completely undoes the carbon benefit. Also the clathrate gun hypothesis, hypothesis, which sounds like something really cool in sci-fi. Basically, uh, you know, as the climate warms, it melts the ice, releases the methane, 
planet gets warmer and it's just a negative cycle, and I guess this has happened a few times. And then on top of it, there's a moral hazard, because why bother to develop alternative energy sources, you know, if we have 300 years of oil? And last things. So some of the sort of scary things about it is you might see uh, lowered international cooperation and the potential conflict over ocean rights, because oil is, strangely enough, one of the reasons a lot of countries force each other to get along with each other. So, yeah, that's all I got. All right, and I'm on. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Marcus Morrison. I'm a developer at LifeChurch.tv. We are in Oklahoma City. Moving on. Uh, I had the uh, privilege of working on a tool for develop.me. It is a uh, annual review tool for churches. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you a little bit about some of the challenges I had while working on that. So uh, in the annual review process, we have, we have states. Uh, so in the states, we have a self-review, a leader review, a summary of that review, and then the action plan, which are the steps taken to get better and grow. And then obviously, a review is completed. So if anybody sees where I'm going with this, I was trying to figure out what to do. How do I handle those states? How do I move from one to another? So I looked at some options. There was enum, sounded cool. Nifty Array, those are fun. Timestamp Party, like 15 timestamps, check them all. Who doesn't want to manage that later after me? Status Attribute, complete, move on. All those seemed a little bit of a headache. So luckily, we all know in the Ruby community, we have gems. So after some research, primarily, I found three gems. I found one that was wicked, and what made me kind of look at wicked was it let me step back and think of this not necessarily as states, but more as a walkthrough, a wizard, go from step one, step two, step three. To me, made complete sense, humanize it a little bit. So next one was state machine, which if anybody in here has done a state machine, they probably looked at gem. Uh, it was really cool, uh, was really heavy handed for what I needed. And unfortunately, I could not relate to the example. I think it was how to build a car. I wasn't building a car, so couldn't really relate to it. Uh, another one I found, which is fairly recent, was Statesman. Uh, what I liked about Statesman and kind of drew me towards Statesman was that it allowed for different states for various model attributes. So I knew that I needed states and I knew that I wanted to manage it in one place and I knew that I wanted that attribute to help manage it. So Statesman, I did not create this. Some awesome company named GoCardless did. Please check them out, gotta give them props. So what I really liked about Statesman is that it allowed me to decouple my logic of my models from views and controllers, so that was really nice. It also had guarded transitions, so in order to move on from A to B, that it helped me protect myself from moving on too soon. Also, full audit history. Here's an example of what it looked like. Uh, so list of states, list of transitions, that's what I'm going from and to. Uh, I can define what to do after and before and I can define what to do within those transitions. So really nice, really easy, really smooth. So I just wanted to you know, help somebody out if they are looking for gems or thinking about they need a state machine. Just wanted to give everybody a heads up that there's a really awesome one that exists. Um, on Twitter, I am at M. Morrison, uh, also on GitHub, and thank you. My name is uh, Avery T. Howard, Jawahara on Twitter, uh, principal and founder at dojo4.com. Uh, we're a web and mobile agency right around the corner here. And what I'm gonna talk to you about briefly today is just to get you thinking outside the box uh, about static site generation and just the power of static HTML in general. Um, at Dojo4, we do a lot of static websites using Middleman. Um, if you're not familiar with it, um, it's a data-driven site generator in Ruby. Um, just some examples of, got a little bit of data here, templates, looks a lot like Rails, but at, at the end of the day, you're just blowing out a bunch of static HTML. Um, we manage some extremely big sites uh, with this technology, such as skinup.com, um, which is fully static. Um, that's deployed uh, via S3 CloudFront, um, and it's a, it's a monstrosity of a site. Uh, the internal team there, um, they're developers, and so they, they have no problem sort of managing that code base. 
um, but it's been a huge success over their previous WordPress site in terms of like robustness and speed, ease of management. And uh, for you designers in the room, 100% flexibility for doing really sophisticated, responsive designs with no limitations. Um, so we build a lot of those, and they're cool. Um, but we've really been pushing the boundaries of these. When you're building static sites, people often think about, how can I change them? So we're doing everything from mashups that, for example, uh, pull in data, say, from Tumblr, to give people the ability to author. We're also uh, our own website. We have an integration with Draftin, where we used to write little robots that pull and build and compile our site on the fly. The most recently, the, the coolest thing that we've done recently, I think, is actually using Rails as a static site generator. So we prepared a bunch of sites for the Stand Up to Cancer Telethon. It's on 27 networks, tremendous amounts of load. Um, and so we developed this little strategy that we use in Rails. We use Rails to recursively build itself and push it out to S3, super high tech. Some of you old timers can recognize there. Um, and with that, we've been able to, uh, I was just gonna show you an image here of our server load. Um, with 27 networks hitting a single server, uh, four applications. This big spike is actually a deployment and asset compilation. And then we basically sat there at nothing um, while $100 million was raised in 45 minutes. Um, so just want to encourage people to start thinking outside of the box around what static means. Um, everyone knows that naming, caching, hardest problems in computer science. and Everybody's probably worked on a, on a Rails app with crazy, crazy complicated cache busting and the amount of money that you can spend and effort chasing that. You don't necessarily have to think about caching on the back end. You can think about caching on the front end um, and using out-of-the-box tools, Jekyll, but also some custom things. Um, one, little, one little last tidbit I'll make is this, uh, this, this, this methodology that we're using, where we have Rails recursively start Passenger with 16 threads, mirror itself, push it up to S3 and CloudFront. Uh, for this particular application, the, the customer is actually logging into an admin and making changes, and then they have an editorial process where they make a, a, a build, they can preview it, deploy it, um, and then, of course, like a link to that build. But this particular build needed to occur quite quickly, and we analyzed many, many other static site generators, such as Hugo, it's written in Go, um, super fast, whatever. Um, and so this particular site we were building in around 300 seconds. With Hugo, that was at around 10. And with this very simple way of using Rails to build static, we were actually able to bring that down to about three seconds um, with about 500 lines of Ruby. So encourage people to think outside the box about static site generation, and uh, think static first on your projects. So I am uh, I'm Doc Norton. Uh, I am Global Director of Engineering Culture with Groupon. Uh, it's a big, long title. Uh, it basically means that my job is to fold the social graph in engineering try and get our teams all kind of connected to each other and agreeing on how we work together. Uh, and this talk, sorry, um, is actually a two hour workshop that I usually give. Um, but I'm gonna do it in five minutes, so hold on, right? Uh, somebody asked a question earlier today, how do you get everybody on the same page? How do you get everybody happy on a team? Well, it's not easy, but there's some tools that we can use. So let's roll through this. Uh, we're basically gonna cover three simple things. Um, simple team decisions, forming the right team, and thinking in parallel, all right? So simple team decisions, right? These are basically think just binary decisions. Uh, relatively low risk, low complexity, high certainty type stuff that decisions teams need to make. A uh, good example, we're a startup, and we're deciding that we're gonna actually start supplying coffee in the office, and someone says, hey, what about Pete's, right? Um, and oftentimes when this stuff, when these kinds of things come up, it's a pretty simple question, yes or no. Um, but what we find is there's a lot of conversation that goes on. If you call for a vote, a lot of people are kind of hesitant, they're not sure. So something that we use often to help with this is, called, is something called fist to five. Um, you folks may be familiar with it, you may not be. Uh, oftentimes, at the beginning of a discussion, we'll call for a fist to five vote. 
All right, so say, hey, should we, should we get Pete's, right? And the reason we do this is, uh, so fist to five is everything. Fist is I absolutely disagree to five is like, I'll go get the coffee every morning, right? Um, and using this scale, people have an opportunity to, rather than just saying yes or no, express some level of hesitation or support. Uh, and so by calling for a fist to five vote, oftentimes what we find is if everybody's two or below, that's a no. If everybody's three or above, that's a yes. And oftentimes there's only one or two outliers, so we can then focus in on, okay, well, why do you feel differently than the rest of the group? What, should we, you, know, what do you know that other folks don't, right? Um, so we'll call for these before uh, conversation ensues, or if there's a lot of conversation going on, maybe someone will just call for fist to five. Now, that's a simple thing, but what about um, you know, more complex problems? One of the challenges we have is, you know, does collaboration really mean everyone? Right? We've got a complex problem, we want to work together as a team, but when we have everybody involved in the conversation, it's hard for things to move forward. I'll give you an example. Uh, what kind of chairs do we want to purchase for the office, right? Here's something that comes up, and that conversation oftentimes, you know, as it goes on, there's a lot of people that are participating in the conversation, you might actually see uh, the conversation kind of dies away and then it comes back up again. And if you look at all of these exchanges that are happening here, there's something that kind of stands out. There's at least one person, if not more, that are participating in the conversation, but they're also preceding their statement with things like, well, I don't really care, but... And I actually came across this and asked the individual, um, so what's going on? You keep saying you don't care, but you keep contributing. So, well, I really don't care. Uh, as it turns out, I have a custom chair that I have to use because of some back problems, blah, blah, blah. So whatever you guys decide on, I'm still going to use my chair. So, well, then why are you in the conversation? And he said, because we're all in the conversation. So how do we get the right people in the conversation in the first place? How do we form the right team without someone in power saying, you, shut up and go away. You, you're allowed to speak, right? How does the team self-organize? Self so what we use is collaboration contracts. Um, I'm going to go through this pretty quick as I'm doing all of this stuff pretty quick. So collaboration contracts are fairly simple. Uh, what we do is you can do it on dry erase board or you can use Google Forms or you can, you know, whatever, whatever format you want, right? But they're basically uh, five categories. Uh, I'm, going to exp I'm, going to, I'm going to make the decision. I'm the sole decision maker and I will explain to you uh, why I made that decision. Um, I'm going to consult with others, but I'm still the sole decision maker, right? Um, I want to actually agree with, with folks, and once we're in agreement, then that's the decision. Uh, I'd like to advise, so I don't have to be a decision maker, but I'd at least like to have my voice heard, or I'd like to inquire. In other words, I don't really care what the outcome is, just let me know if I need to log my time over here or over there, right? I don't have an opinion here. So what we do is we have people on the team actually, based on whatever the topic is, put their name in the column where they think that they should be, and then look at, all right, how did that work for us? So here's an example, right? So here's a team of, of eight folks. Um, and let's just say this is an HR concern. Uh, and Joe's our VP of HR, and Alice is our of counsel, and then the other folks are other, other individuals in the company, right? So when they put their names up on this chart, uh, the challenge that we have here is Joe is a consult saying, I'm the sole decision maker, and Alice wants to be in agreement with the decision. That's a conflict. We can't have that. So a conversation happens. Alice says, you know what, I trust Joe, I'll move down, great, right? So now we've got the right people on the team. Why are decisions still so difficult? Oh, I got the time here and it's different. <laughs> Can I blow through this? Yes. All right, all right. So uh, first thing, we've got different personalities, right? So Myers-Briggs type, there's three different uh, categories in a modifier. Just that alone gives us 16 different personality types. If this doesn't resonate with you, this probably will. If this doesn't, I know this will, right? <laughs> the challenge is that even with all those different personality types, we also have different perspectives. You see uh, through your own filter. So if you look at this, you know exactly what figure creates that shadow. If you look at this, you know what figure creates that shadow, right? Those are through your filters. You're wrong. And finally, I blame these dudes. These guys taught us that argument is the, is the way that we communicate, right? Back and forth argument. So you combine all this, and what do we get? We get these nasty discussions where people are talking about something, but they're talking about it from completely different perspectives. So the way we resolve this is with a, a technique called six thinking hats, right? And I'm not going to go through the rest of this, but basically what happens is you get the team all talking about one aspect of the problem. What is critical? What is, what is, what is the risk here, 
right? And everyone lists the risks. Then you talk about what are the opportunities. Everyone lists the opportunities. What this does is it eliminates the whole combative back and forth. It gets everybody thinking in the same way and helps the, uh, the, the team get to actual consensus. Um, you can learn more about this. Uh, Edward de Bono actually came up with this. That's it. Sorry about the time. All right. No presentation for me, but I can just talk. So I want to introduce real fast a project called QT Bindings. I don't. I had some nice slides and. Oh well. <laughs> So Qt Bindings is a uh, Ruby uh, bindings for Qt. Uh, it's developed by myself and Jason Thomas, who's right back there. Um, if you want to create desktop GUIs in Ruby, it's a great way to do it. It uses the Qt GUI framework. Uh, Cross-platform, it works on Mac, Linux, Windows. Installation's easy, especially on Windows. On Mac, you have to do a couple other extra things, but read the readme. Um, Bummer, I don't have my slides. So check out QT Bindings, github.com slash ryanmelt, R-Y-A-N-M-E-L-T slash QT Bindings. Thanks. OK, hi. Um, my name is Shelby. This is Luke. This is Peter. We're from G School. Woo! Uh, we do lightning talks there as well, and I didn't feel like doing that. So I wrapped instead, um, and now it's kind of a thing. I didn't have time to make any visual candy, because we decided to do this today. So. Uh, I found some backup dancers to put in place of that. Yeah. So here goes nothing. <laughs> yeah. 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 We at Rocky Mountain Ruby getting it done, learning things from speakers and also having fun. Basking in this beautiful Colorado sun, the reign of the best conference has begun. Here comes the speakers and the sponsors. Go ahead and say, hey, they ain't monsters. In reality, they are code conquerors. Chatting about programming is what they prefer. Let's grab some gems that we can install. Not the sparkly kind you can buy at the mall. We better at this than play in baseball. But now your app works with that new method call. Now we can move along and talk about our spec. I thought I had a green dots until I checked. My command line and their feet F like rejects. It's still something I'm going to have to perfect. Everybody in the theater writing Ruby. Everybody in the theater writing Ruby. Everybody in the theater writing Java. Nah. Everybody in the theater writing Ruby. Rainbow Tables was the best slide ever. Talking about Triple D with Abby as he was clever. It's all right. Nicolay was live coding like whatever. I could watch these people talk basically forever. I'm also really digging all the free swag. It's making my imaginary tail wag. I wish I could fit it all in my bag. My dresser is exploding, but I don't mean to brag. Ruby on the bet rails is the best thing out there. It makes a great boyfriend if you need a spare. It does stuff for you so you don't have to swear at your computer screen and then throw it in midair. I'm gonna throw it out there, rails is the best. MVC's everywhere, but it ain't no mess. I can build anything driven by some tests. I really think we're all just hashtag less. Everybody in the theater writing Ruby. Everybody in the theater writing Ruby. Everybody in the theater writing PHP? Nah. Everybody in the theater writing Ruby. <laughs> the Boulder Theater was a great place to host this event, except we broke the Wi-Fi, sorry, got a vent. Thank you for the free internet is what I meant. Don't try to push that code to production just yet. Choose to send grid for that mixer last night. And how about Pivotal's deck? That was tight. Chatting and drinking with you guys is all right. I hope no one's too hung over for the flight. Everybody in the theater writing Ruby. <laughs> Everybody in the theater writing Ruby. Everybody in the theater writing C sharp. No, I don't even know what that is. Everybody in the theater writing Ruby. Shelby and friends. Shelby and friends from G School.